Hello, my name is Michael Glass, and I'm the Regional Studies Association's Territorial Chair for the United States. The Regional Studies Association is a learned society concerned with the analysis of regions and regional issues. Through our international membership, we provide an authoritative voice for and a network of academics, students, practitioners, and policymakers. You can find out more about the RSA, including information on membership, funding opportunities, and events at regionalstudies.org. I'm pleased to present a new installment of our Regionalists on Film series that introduces you to the work of established and emerging regional scholars and to their scholarship. Today, it's my special privilege to introduce Professor Jose Maria Cardoso de Silva. Professor Silva is a professor of geography and sustainable development at the University of Miami. Professor Silva's work examines the relationships between socioeconomic development and environmental conservation in tropical regions. Integrating concepts and theories from several disciplines, he uses a regional approach to promote sustainable development solutions in tropical countries, particularly South America. He's also a fellow of the American Ornithological Society. Professor Silva, welcome. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, can I uh, start by asking you how you first became interested in, in researching regions and regional development? Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm a biogeography by training. And one of the first things that biogeographers do is to synthesize the information about the distribution of species and the ecosystems and use this information to identify biological or ecological regions. So that's the first step to identify regions. Then we study two processes. The first process is, or the first kind of process that you are interested in is, is are the process that generate and maintain the species and the ecosystems within each one of the regions. And the second group of process that we are interested in are the processes responsible for the flows of species and ecosystems across regions. And of course, because we are studying biological systems, we use a, some kind of systemic and evolutionary approach in biogeography. So that's my background. In 2001, I was invited to lead biodiversity conservation programs for one international organization. First, I began in Brazil, but after a few years, I was managing programs in several tropical countries on four continents. So my work was basically to help societies from local to regional to design and implement plans to conserve their species and ecosystems. And these plans to be useful and acceptable by the local decision makers they must take into consideration social, political, and economical factors. So in addition, they also needed to show how the conservation of species and ecosystems can contribute to improve the living standards of a society. Because of this experience, I realized that I was not doing biogeography and conservation anymore. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> I was work with local and regional socio-ecological systems, each one with a different history and with a different sets of unique properties. So in the end, I realized that I was not doing biogeography and conservation and I was doing regional development. <laughs> so because of that, I became more interested in the, all the scholarship associated with regional development. And over time, I realized that the general systemic evolutionary approach that I use in biogeography can also be used in regional development. So you can use the same kind of framework that you learn in biogeography, we can apply to regional development. Then when I left the international organization in 2015 and joined the University of Miami, I decided to design my research program around regional development in tropical countries by using the biogeographical framework, mm -hmm. by applying the biogeographical framework to regional studies. 
So that explains a little bit about um, also why, given your background as a biogeographer, you've, you've expanded out into this interdisciplinary uh, work and, and contribution. Uh, what does the geographic tradition uh, contribute to that scholarship, the way that it's evolved over time? Yeah, you know, geography is a unique discipline that combines both social and natural science. There's no discipline that combines both, at least in the social science, and that's unique. In addition, geography provides the analytical tools required to understand how social ecological systems change over time and space. So I combine the concepts and tools of geography to do my work. I can tell you without the concepts and tools of, of geography, I would not be able to do my work. So most of my work is really based on different kinds of traditions in geography, but has a strong spatial component. I wonder if we can um, drill down into that a little bit and maybe talk about some of the, the policy implications that come from the, the, the approaches that you're taking. And I'm thinking about the recent work that you've been involved in uh, that's really looking at the, the intersection between local economic growth and set aside protected areas in Brazil. Um, could you share a little bit about what your focus on conservation policy has uncovered? Yeah, of course. In the last few years, most of my work was carried out in the Brazilian Amazon. That's one reason I'm from the Brazilian Amazon. <laughs> So that's one of the reasons. The second re reason is I know where well in the division look is a very nice experiment. It's a nice place to do this kind of work. This region has around 4.5 million kilometers and it's home to 25 million people. The region is also the most important by diverse region on the planet. And it's extremely important in regulating the global climate. So studies so far demonstrate that you need to protect at least 80% of the region's ecosystems to avoid a regional or perhaps global ecological collapse. So the big question for regional scientists should be, how can we achieve this huge conservation accomplishment and at the same time improve the living standards of the regional population? I believe, because of my history, that the best way to get things done to achieve these two things at the same time is to protect, is to set aside 80% of the region in protected areas and indigenous lands. And the, the good thing is Brazil has all the policies in place to do that. It's possible to achieve. So, but. This is the idea, but you want to test if this option is politically, economically viable. I had to do some research to get with my colleagues. And uh, the first work was to check if the local population, the Amazonian population, in, in fact supports policies connected to the creation and the expansion of protected areas and indigenous lands in the Amazon. And we did some research about that, and we found a broad political support for these conservation areas. Perhaps because most of the population live in the Amazon, they live in the cities. So they found that they get more information, they get better education because they are living in the cities. And as a consequence, they think it's a good idea to protect nature and to start to think about how this protected areas over time can generate products, services that can be used to, to improve the local economies. So basically we have a broad political support for conservation areas. Then we, uh, we did a second research, second, we asked a second question was to see if the protected areas and the indigenous lands constrain local economic growth. Why did that? Because the politicians in the region, when they want to go against protected areas, this is the first thing that they say. No, the expansion of protected areas is going to constrain local economic development, local economic development, because these areas could be used in other kinds of economic activities. 
So that's the main argument. So we did an analysis using different kinds of regression models, and we didn't find any negative relationship between the proportion of the municipalities within conservation areas and economical growth. So there's no connection. So protected areas, they don't constrain local development, local economic development. And I start to think, well, but at least protected areas could help the local development, local economic growth, if the protected areas received enough resources in order to, to be implemented, in order to be fully implemented, because the protected areas can do a lot of things, can generate a lot of research for the local communities, but they can do that only if they are fully implemented. So basically what you did was to go there and to check all the database from the government in order to, to evaluate the budgets of the protected areas, in order to see if they had received enough resources to be fully implemented and then contribute to the local economies. Uh, our result is, it's very sad. In fact, what you did, we found was a huge financial gap. Over time, the government is not investing, the government, the federal and the state governments are not investing enough in the protected areas in order to make them really fully functional. So because of that, we ask another question <laughs> that was, how much will it cost to protect 80% of the region in protected areas in indigenous land? Can we estimate that? And that's what you did. We estimate that, around, that in order to protect 80% of the Amazon, we needed to invest between 1.7 and $2.8 billion a year. A year. You can say, ah, this is a huge amount of money. It's not. It's almost nothing compared to the value or compared to the benefits that the conservation of the Amazon will generate for Brazil, but also for other countries, including the United States and European countries as well, because of the role that the, the Amazonian forest has unregulated the global climate. So in the end, we say, look, the idea is possible. <laughs> this idea is still there. It's possible. It's politically viable. There's enough political support to implement a large set of protected areas in the Amazon. And it's financially viable because $1.7, $2.8 billion a year is almost nothing compared to other kinds of expenses that the world is, has around, that Brazil and the other countries have around. So now what you're doing is trying to, to, to study how, what's going to be the, the potential impact of these investments on the region's local economies. So, but that's something that's going to take some time because it requires a lot of additional data. So that's basically what I have found so far. Wow, and that's really interesting. I wonder if I could follow up and, and ask about the, the, the members of the public that came into the study and whether their level of environmental consciousness or awareness uh, was in some way linked to a, a, a regional consciousness uh, that they were members of a shared regional space or are, are people thinking much more in local terms? No, they are thinking about it. It's, that's fascinating because first we found that the Amazonians, they think about the region. <laughs> And they really see the importance of the protection of the forest, not only for themselves, but for everybody else. And also, that was another thing that I found that is really relevant. There was no difference between poor and rich, <laughs> with educated people and more educated people, and less educated people, between genders or age. There was no relationship. All these factors, in fact, they didn't interfere in the in the in the attitude of one individual about conservation, so I think it's a it's a very robust data set, and I know that several people did the same thing in other places in the Brazilian Amazon, and basically they found the same results. So right now we have really good kinds of political support for the expansion of the protected areas in the Amazon. All right. 
Now, as a, as a scholar that came into um, an interest in regional studies based on the questions you were asking, um, I, I'm curious about your evaluation of the current state of regional scholarship. Uh, what you see is perhaps the opportunities and the challenges that regional scholars can address. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question. So, you know, I'm new to these areas, so I'm still exploring regional studies. And what I found out is, I believe the researchers on regional studies, they are doing excellent work, but they are mostly concentrated on the social and economical dimensions of the social ecological systems. And this is a problem. I understand the reason why there's the traditions, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not the best way to move on with the discipline. I think we should expand the agenda and you also include the ecological dimension in the research agenda. So regional scientists or people doing regional studies, they have always to ask questions. We always have to take into consideration the environmental dimensions to their questions. Otherwise, we don't have a clear idea about how the social ecological systems are working. So that's the first thing. And in terms of opportunities and challenges, I think it's, a, it's very clear. I think the most important global challenge today is how societies are going to transition from the current traditional development models to a more sustainable development models. That's why I'm using plural. There's no one model, but there'll be maybe different models, different regions are going to follow different models. So that's the big thing. That's what everybody is trying to find out. The decision makers, the NGOs, the companies, how you can make this transition. And you know, in my perspective, from my perspective, that should be the work of the people work with regional, this should be the main agenda, research agenda of people work with regional studies, right? Mm -hmm. So I think engaging and contributing more to this transition to develop sustainable development is, I think, one of huge opportunity and challenge for our community. I'd like to see people doing regional studies, more engaged in this sustainability transition. Some people call it sustainability transformation. I think this is a huge agenda that we should, we should spend more time discussing and uh, I don't know, building some kind of theoretical framework because it's, I think people work with regional studies, they have really a good experience thinking about that. Thanks so much. Um, that's all the time we have available to talk with Professor Silva, but I'd like to uh, thank him for joining us today to provide his uh, perspective on regional scholarship. I'd also like to encourage all of you to learn more about regional studies and the Regional Studies Association at regionalstudies.org. Um, Jose, would you care to have the last word today? Yeah, sure. Thanks for this opportunity. And uh, let's keep making regional studies more relevant than ever. I agree heartily with that sentiment. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.